Good evening. Welcome to Taking a Deep Cleansing Breath, Updates and Management of Chronic Rhinosinusitis with Nasal Polyps. My name is Tara Carr. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Arizona. My disclosures are listed on this slide. We have three learning objectives for this evening. The first is to analyze the phenotypes and endotypes of chronic rhinosinusitis with and without nasal polyps based on what is understood thus far about immunologic pathophysiology and its impact on disease burden. We'll summarize the mechanisms of action of new and emerging targeted biologics for CRS with nasal polyps, as well as the efficacy and safety profiles revealed in the clinical trials for these drugs. And finally, we'll implement shared decision-making with CRS with nasal polyp patients to determine when a biologic, surgical, or other treatment is most appropriate. So we're gonna get started with some pre-test polling. This is, um, I encourage you to answer these questions if you can through the device on which you're participating. Uh, this first question is, the primary cytokines involved in type 2 inflammation, the most common endotype in patients with CRS with nasal polyps, are, is it interferon gamma and IL-12? Is it TNF-alpha and IL-6? Is it IL-4, 13 and IL-5? Or IL-17 and IL-2? We'll give you a few seconds to select your answer and we'll move on. There's going to be a few questions here and we'll ask these again at the end. Okay, we'll go ahead to the next question. Which biologic showed improvement in nasal polyp score by at least two points in close to half the patient population at weeks 24 and 52? Was it benralizumab, dupilumab, mepolizumab, or omalizumab? Okay, we'll give it a um, couple more seconds in. Which is the most commonly observed treatment emergent adverse event across the clinical trials of all biologics studied for CRS with nasal polyps? Do we see epistaxis, injection site reactions, nasopharyngitis, or abdominal pain? Okay, I think we can go ahead and move to the next question. Okay, and then Mr. Brown, a 42-year-old male patient with severe CRS with nasal polyps, returns 12 months after endoscopic surgery, complaining of persistent symptoms. You suspect nasal polyps have regrown as type two inflammation is a predictor of polyp return in greater than 50% of cases. Disease scoring systems show some improvement, but do not meet euphoria criteria for adequate response. What does euphoria recommend now? Do we return to medical management and short course of oral corticosteroids? Do we consider a biologic drug or revision surgery? Do we recommend an exhalation delivery system with fluticasone or corticosteroid eluding implantable stent? Okay, great. Feeling discouraged, Mr. Brown says, if the nasal polyps are just going to grow back anyway, he doesn't want to go through all the expense, pain, and downtime of undergoing surgery again. So shared decision-making means the best action now would be to A, advise him to reconsider surgery because 30% of patients do require repeat surgeries. B, apprise him what the guidelines recommend and ask him to decide between the two options. Three, give him information about all available biologicals and ask him to choose one. Or four, let him know all his therapeutic options and the pros and cons of each. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for participating in the pretest polling. So we'll go ahead and get started then uh, with a case study. Uh, so this is Bob, who is a 45 year old man who has chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or CRS with NP. Um, he also has asthma as a comorbidity. And he's in your clinic because his polyps have gotten worse over the past two years. And he's required multiple steroid bursts within the past two years to try to control his symptoms. Um, he's compliant with the saline irrigation that you've recommended and the intranasal corticosteroids that you've recommended. But despite this, he's losing sleep, work productivity, and his social life is negatively affected. He's never had surgery, 
So what is the uh, additional information would we consider important at this point? Um, do we consider doing blood biomarkers of an eosinophil count and an IgE level? Do we do a CT scan of his sinuses or nasal endoscopy to see about polyps and the extent of his disease? Would we do spirometry to assess his asthma? Would we do exhaled nitric oxide level uh, to assess the inflammation in his airway? Um, this is not a polling question, but um, a little bit of food for thought about what you might do as a clinician. We'll start by talking about what is chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, chronic rhinosinusitis is a disease that affects 28.9 million Americans in the United States um, based on the CDC, and that's about 11, 12% of the general population. 20% um, of these patients have the nasal polyp subtype, and these tend to be a little bit more male. 80% of these patients have the non-polypoid subtype, and these tend to be predominantly female. Um, interestingly, uh, the United States has the highest prevalence of chronic rhinosinusitis in the world. Uh, and you can see here that the, the estimate of about 12% in the United States is very much higher from our neighbors to the north, um, Canada, where it's less than 5%, Brazil, where it's 5.5%, Europe, 11%, China and Korea, lower. Uh, and it's not just that sinusitis is a thing, it actually costs money um, for the patients and for the healthcare system. Um, medical costs are very high for patients who have this disease, particularly for those who have nasal polyposis. Um, using this observational study of more than 21,000 patients in a large claims database, matching patients with polyps to individuals without polyps, the polyp patients incurred more than $11,000 more in annual medical costs than the non-polyp patients and you can see that that's kind of spread out across medical costs, office costs, and pharmacy costs. How do we diagnose um, CRS? So chronic rhinosinusitis is really diagnosed using a combination of clinical criteria, which make you suspect it, and then objective criteria, which help you to confirm it. The clinical criteria, you'd like to see at least 12 weeks of at least two of these symptoms. So mucopurulent drainage, so running out the front, down the back or both, um, sense of nasal congestion or obstruction of breathing through the nose, facial pain, pressure, or fullness from the situs cavities usually, or a decreased sense of smell. When we try to confirm that somebody has chronic sinusitis, if you have endoscopy present, you can look into the nose, into the ostea, the drainage tracts of the sinuses to see if there's uh, edema locally, if there's mucopurulent drainage coming out of the sinus cavities, and if there are polyps, and if so, how big they are. A sinus CAT scan um, can help to look in the nasal cavity, but also can document the degree of inflammation in the paranasal sinuses, which you may not be able to see into on endoscopy. Symptoms can be slightly different when comparing patients with and without nasal polyps. Patients without nasal polyps have more of a um, sort of a thickening and filling of the sinus cavities. It can affect the frontal sinuses, the ethmoid sinuses, the maxillary sinuses. Um, and these patients tend to feel a lot more facial pain and pressure because of filling of those sinuses and inflammation. Um, the nasal polyp patients tend to have more of a polypoid change and filling of their sinus cavities. Um, the polyps can grow into the nasal cavity and cause a significant sense of loss of smell. Um, on the right panel, you can see a comparison of CT scan between a normal patient and somebody who has severe chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps. I think you can appreciate that in the maxillary sinuses, whereas the control patient has nice, clear, black, aerated sinuses, the nasal polyp patient has circumferential filling with this sort of polypoid structure, and not only the maxillary sinuses, but into the ethmoids between the eyes um, and in the nasal cavity as well. And if you've never seen a nasal polyp before, the picture at the bottom right um, is a, a very representative photo of what nasal polyp can look like. Um, it's this shiny structure that can be grayish in appearance. It can look almost translucent, like a grape that's been peeled. Um, and it can uh, take up a lot of the nasal cavity and, and obscure surrounding structures. Um, the Euphoria, the European Forum for Research and Education in Allergy and Airways Diseases, um, put together a 2021 update in chronic rhinosinusitis, which was published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology this year. Um, and this um, Euphoria update 
uh, describes a definition for uncontrolled nasal polyps as well as severe nasal polyps. So people are considered to have uncontrolled nasal polyps if their polyps are persistent or recurring despite using intranasal corticosteroids long-term and having received at least one course of oral corticosteroids or previous sinonasal surgery in the past year. Um, severe chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps um, requires that you have bilateral nasal polyps with a nasal polyp score at least greater than four. The nasal polyp score is, is the size of the polyps, which is determined by endoscopy. We'll talk about that in a little bit of a later slide. So they have big polyps with persistent symptoms um, despite intranasal corticosteroids as appropriate. And those persistent symptoms can be determined by sense of smell, nasal congestion score, the SNOP22 score, or total symptom visual analog score. Chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps also commonly coexists with other disorders. Uh, many patients with nasal polyposis also have aspirin or NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease. Um, and nasal polyps are a, one of the, um, the uh, a big piece of the triad that characterizes this disease. Uh, many patients with nasal polyps also have asthma, um, and many patients with nasal polyps also have ATP or comorbid allergic rhinitis. You can see that some patients with non-polyp disease also have asthma and allergic rhinitis, uh, but those diseases are much more common in people who have the, the polyp form of disease. Um, and not only are you more likely to have asthma if you have nasal polyps, but the presence of nasal polyps really portends worse asthma control and risk of exacerbations. Um, this comparison between um, asthma with polyps and asthma without polyps shows that the patients who have polyps have a lower FEV1, so lower lung function. They have more eosinophils in their blood and sputum. They tend to require more asthma medication by inhaled corticosteroid dose to control their disease. Their control score is worse, showing that they're um, more symptomatic. And the association between polyps and exacerbations is shown on the right. This um, aspirin or NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease is a classic triad of asthma, nasal polyps, and hypersensitivity to those meds. Um, this occurs in about 30% of patients who have both nasal polyposis and asthma. Uh, the asthma tends to be pretty severe and difficult to control. These patients generally require a lot of medication to control their symptoms, have reduced lung function, and require lots of steroids. The nasal polyposis is a, tends to be pretty severe as well. The polyps have lots of eosinophils. They affect all of the sinus cavities, and these patients are quite symptomatic. And then when they take aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, so any drugs that um, block the COX-1 enzyme, they have a um, respiratory reaction, meaning worsening nasal and lung symptoms as a result of that medication. So now we'll move on to the inflammatory endotypes and pathophysiology of CRS with nasal polyps. Um, so in Endotypes are basically the biochemical, molecular, and cellular um, reasons that we have these diseases. And um, there's a lot of talk about endotypes in airway disease and, and how that might help us to identify treatment options for our patients. So for chronic rhinosinusitis, um, we acknowledge that you can have three major types of inflammation present in the sinus tissue. That first type inflammation, type one inflammation, is the type one inflammation we think about as, as being present in many other types of diseases. These are um, type one helper T cells that secrete cytokines like interferon gamma. You have innate lymphoid cells that are present, cytotoxic CD8 cells and natural killer cells, um, and macrophages that help to support this, this kind of pro-inflammatory process. Lots of IL-12 production as well. And this leads to really that a purulent discharge that we see in the non-polypoid sinusitis. Um, so this would be a normal immune response to an infection or chronic infection um, and inflammation related to that. Type 2 um, is more of an allergic mast cells eosinophils and helper T cells type two and innate lymphoid cells type two. And these cells secrete IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, which are those classic type two cytokines. Um, and patients who have type two inflammation predominantly have nasal polyps. They often have asthma that shares that type two inflammation. They can be quite symptomatic. 
Um, you can see type 2 inflammation in non-polyp disease, but it tends to be um, a, a much more common in the type in the polypoid disease. And then finally, type 3 inflammation is something that many people don't think about yet, but it's certainly emerging as um, a very important type of inflammation in which um, helper 17 cells um, and type 3 innate lymphoid cells um, secrete molecules such as IL-17, which help to recruit neutrophils and that can contribute to purulent nasal discharge in these diseases. So when we think about the, the uh, types of, the, of chronic rhinosinusitis, the non-polypoid and the polypoid disease, if we're going to make a summary table, and for CRS without nasal polyps, these patients tend to have a predominantly Th1 profile. Th17 can also be there. And they can have asthma. They can have allergic rhinitis. They can have both asthma and allergic rhinitis. The, the patients with polyps um, are tend to be much more Th2 characteristically in their sinus tissue, and they have more prevalent asthma, allergic rhinitis, comorbid, um, both diseases, and the aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease. So let's focus in a little bit more on the type 2 inflammation. Uh, so the type 2 cytokines that I mentioned before, IL-4, IL-5, and 13, um, are, all, are all represented on this slide. Um, but this starts at the epithelium. So we'll look at the left-hand side of the slide first. Uh, so what we're recognizing is very important in airway disease, and particularly in chronic sinusitis, is an abnormal epithelial layer. So your barrier, your protective barrier, um, is not functioning normally. Um, and allergens, bacteria, viruses, and other, um, and other irritants or um, damaging factors can um, interact with that epithelium, can cause that epithelium to be um, dysfunctional, and that epithelium can release a class of molecules called alarmins, which includes the thymic stromal lymphopoietin, IL-25, and IL-33. And these alarmins really influence this type 2 inflammation by recruiting and activating both innate lymphoid cells and helper T cells, both of the type 2 subtype. Um, so moving to the right-hand side on the top level, you see um, the allergic pathway, which is really what a lot of us think about first when we think about type 2 inflammation. Um, in the presence of IL-4 and IL-13, B cells in our bodies or in our tissues can switch to production of IgE. Uh, and they can pump out IgE, which then lands on mast cells all over our body um, and can be degranulated and can activate mast cells and basophils upon um, exposure to allergens. But interestingly, you can have activation of B cells and you can have um, uh, antibody production through um, Staph aureus superantigen presentation locally, as well as um, other local inflammation. Um, eosinophilic inflammation is characteristic in nasal polyps as well. IL-5, which is released by the Th2 cells and the ILC2s, recruits eosinophils. Those eosinophils can live longer, they're more active, they can traffic into the tissues and be long-lived into the tissues and can contribute to the inflammation locally as well as the growth of the polyps. And then finally, IL-13 itself seems to be a special cytokine in nasal polyposis, as well as in other diseases like asthma, because it can have direct effects on the epithelium and driving some of the mucus production and goblet cell hyperplasia, as well as some remodeling um, that can contribute to the formation of the sinusitis and polyps through um, fibroblasts influencing collagen production and fibrosis. So we'll get back to our case study of Bob, who, um, as we know, has CRS with nasal polyps and asthma, and he's had two courses within the last two years, so he's not well controlled. So we did a little bit more work for him, um, trying to understand better where his disease process is. Um, some lung function testing showed that his FEV1 is 68% of predicted, which is definitely reduced, um, but he has 17% reversibility, which shows that this is more of an asthma phenotype than a COPD phenotype. His exhaled nitric oxide level is 35, which is sort of middle, it's borderline, it's not that high, it's not that low, and so it doesn't clearly tell us about his type 2 inflammation in the lungs. And for this, he's using a high-dose inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist. Um, he denies any problem taking aspirin or NSAIDs, um, and we now have this information and we can decide how to treat him. So there are a few different therapies that we're going to be talking about today. 
um, and you can start thinking about which of these therapies you might consider for him. Uh, would you recommend that he undergo sinus surgery um, or functional endoscopic sinus surgery at VSS? Would you recommend he start a biologic therapy? Would you recommend that he starts the exhalation delivery system with fluticasone or alternate day oral corticosteroids? So we can talk first about medical management. Uh, the standard of care medical management um, is not that groundbreaking. <laughs> we should be recommending that our patients use saline irrigation through something like a neti pot or a sinus flush bottle. Um, patients who do saline irrigation can have benefit compared with placebo um, doing this regularly. Uh, and um, it might sort of reduce some of the congestion. It might help to remove some of the extra mucus that's being produced and, and might help your patients symptomatically feel better. Intranasal corticosteroids are recommended sort of universally for these patients um, and generally are in the form of nasal sprays, which mostly stay towards the front of the, uh, the nose on the inferior turbinate. Patients can also use nasal installations or drops by putting the corticosteroids into the saline irrigation or by dropping more high potency steroids directly into the nose so it can percolate down into the different sinus cavities. Um, oral corticosteroids are considered to be part of the standard of care for medical management, um, but really these are supposed to be limited to acute relief for patients who are severely symptomatic, who have substantial blockage of their nose and loss of sense of smell. So as many of you probably already know and have experienced yourselves, that standard of care medical management is not really that effective. It does not cure our patients and it really often does not cure their disease. Um, and oral corticosteroids are associated with side effects um, that we are trying to avoid. And so um, let's talk about other therapies. Um, one um, interesting delivery system that was um, be that became available over the past few years is this exhalation delivery system that provides fluticasone um, through um, uh, this this device that you see here, um, wherein the uh, uh, little piece goes into the nose and the patient essentially blows into the device and the um, the fluticasone medication gets distributed throughout the sinus cavity. Um, the FDA approved this in 2017 because the phase three trial, the Navigate 2 trial, um, showed that patients who had nasal polyps had significant reduction in those polyps and were eliminated in 25% on at least one side after 24 weeks of use as compared with 9% with placebo. Um, these patients felt better and needed less surgery. So this is an interesting um, kind of still relatively new um, device that we can offer for our patients to help control their disease. Moving on to the surgical, the functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Um, so this is a surgery that's performed by otolaryngologists, many of whom have additional surgical training in, in rhinology. And so um, a lot of experience doing sinus surgery. Uh, the nice thing about functional endoscopic sinus surgery is um, they're able to kind of debreed all of the sinuses that are affected by the polyposis and chronic sinusitis. And in doing this, patients can have rapid relief of symptoms. So as soon as they recover from surgery, they're feeling great and their nose is open and they can breathe much better. Um, of course, this is a surgery and while it's considered to be minimally, minimally invasive and usually as an outpatient surgery, um, patients can still have side effects or complications from the surgery. Unfortunately, after surgery, um, regrowth of polyps is common. So about 40% of patients will see regrowth of their polyps within about 18 months. Um, and patients are really required to continue regular use of nasal corticosteroids after their surgery to prevent or try to, to slow the regrowth of those polyps. People who have type 2 inflammation, which admittedly represents most of these nasal polyp patients, is a strong predictor of, recur of recurrence of polyps. Um, and the, the complications that can occur are often minor, but there can be major complications. And so, you know, it is a real surgery. Um, uh, this study from Europe um, essentially gave patients normal medical therapy um, with the nasal irrigation, the intranasal corticosteroids, and short-term oral corticosteroids for severe symptoms. Um, but despite this medical management and this cohort of patients, about half of them with nasal polyps required surgery to try to address the disease. Um, and after surgery, the nasal polyps recurred um, at about 20 to 35% at six months, 40% at 18 months. And some of these patients actually require 
more surgeries periodically every few years um, over time to help de debulk their, their sinuses. Um, one interesting um, potentially useful device is called a steroid eluding stent. These are little stents shown here in the pictures below that are implantable into these sinus drainage tracts. Um, and this can be um, put into somebody's sinuses at the time of surgery or after surgery. Um, and we'll deliver local mometasone, which is a steroid, to try to provide local anti-inflammatory relief, help control symptoms, help to keep that sinus open, and hopefully help to prevent polyp regrowth. So now we'll move on to talking about the biologics. So this euphoria group um, uh, put together criteria for considering biological treatment. Uh, and really the criteria include first, that polyps are there and that patients have bilateral polyps. Bilateral polyps, of course, are going to be more symptomatic, but it's important to remember that if a patient has a unilateral polyp, um, there are other diseases that could be mimicking polyps, such as a cancerous tumor. Um, so that should be evaluated, potentially biopsied and removed by an EMT. Uh, patients who have a history of surgery should have at least three of the below criteria. And patients without a history of surgery should have at least four of the, about th the following criteria. So number one, evidence of type two inflammation. Why is this? I think it's because most of the biologics address type two inflammation. And so having that evidence makes it more likely the biologic will be useful. Second, a need for systemic corticosteroids, two or more courses in the past year, which supports the severity of the disease and how symptomatic those patients are. If the patients have a significantly impaired quality of life, significant loss of sense of smell, or if they have a diagnosis of comorbid asthma, because potentially the comorbid asthma may benefit also from that, that uh, biologic therapy for the type 2 disease. Um, so this chart summarizes the currently FDA approved and emerging biologics for nasal polyps. Um, dupilumab, which is an anti-IL-4 receptor alpha antibody, also blocks IL-13 as its mechanism of action. And this was the first to be approved for treatment of nasal polyps in June of 2019. This is indicated as add-on maintenance for adults with uncontrolled polyps, and it's dosed at 300 milligrams subcutaneously every two weeks. Omalizumab is an anti-IgE antibody that was approved for use for nasal polyps in December of 2020 as add-on maintenance for adults with inadequate response to intranasal corticosteroids for their polyps. The dosing for omalizumab is a weight and serum IgE-based dosing that can be um, every two or four weeks based on the level. Um, for people who are familiar with omalizumab dosing for asthma, the dosing for nasal polyps is higher. So make sure to use that new table when you're dosing for this disease. Uh, Mepolizumab is an anti-IL-5 antibody that was approved for treatment of nasal polyps in July of 2021 and is approved for add-on maintenance of, for adults with inadequate response to intranasal steroids. This is a subcutaneous injection given at 100 milligrams every four weeks. And then finally, benralizumab is an anti-IL-5 receptor um, antagonist that um, has not yet been FDA approved, but is in phase three trials for nasal polyposis, and so is um, you know, further ahead in the pipeline. And the dosing for this that's being studied is 30 milligrams every four weeks. We'll look a little bit more at that at some of these trials, um, but it's important to um, understand that these clinical trials really require objective scoring of nasal polyps, not only to say how big they are, but so then you can more objectively and definitively determine how much the medication is helping. So this nasal polyp score gives a score between zero and four for each side of the nose, um, showing how big the polyps are on each side of the nose, and then they're added together for the total score. So this total score can be between zero and eight. A score of zero on each side means that there's no polyps visual. Um, a score of one means that there's a small polyp in the middle meatus of the nose, but that it does not reach, reach below the inferior border of the middle turbinate. So, um, grade two polyps do reach below the lower border of the inferior turbinate. Um, size three um, go to the lower border of the inferior turbinate or are medial to the middle turbinate. And then four are large polyps that completely obstruct the inferior nasal cavity.
Um, nasal congestion scoring is a patient reported evaluation of symptom severity that is also used in clinical trials as a primary or um, a secondary outcome, um, which gives a sense of congestion and obstruction rated over 24 hours. Um, so a scale between zero and three, zero meaning no symptoms. Um, and then as you go up in numbers, it's the increasing severity of symptoms and how much they're impacting your quality of life. So first we'll look at the data for Gpilimab. Um, these, um, there are uh, four graphs that you see here and these represent um, on the left column, the Sinus24 study, which was a 24 week study um, in which participants were given um, therapy or placebo for the first half um, and then taken off of the, the treatment and everybody put on placebo for the second half. Sinus 52 was, an inter was a study where people were either given treatment or placebo, and then the treatment was continued for the 52 weeks. Um, on the top row, we have nasal polyp score. So I think you can appreciate that the gray placebo group um, had not a whole lot of change in their nasal polyp score over time, um, but the group that was treated had a nasal polyp score improvement of about two um, at 24 weeks. And that's the, that nasal polyp score um, started to uh, worsen or they lost benefit once the treatment was discontinued. On the bottom line, you can see nasal congestion and obstruction score. Patients who um, received treatment um, also seem to have an improvement in their nasal congestion or obstruction scores as compared with the placebo groups. But again, this was reversible after therapy. One of the major outcomes of interest also included the reduction of need for bursts of systemic corticosteroids or the need for surgery. Um, and here, the patients who underwent um, therapy with dupilumab every two weeks um, had a reduction in the uh, need for steroids and surgery as compared with the placebo group. The safety um, data are shown here. Uh, so um, generally similar um, uh, adverse events with the placebo group as well as with the treatment group. Um, you can see nasopharyngitis is the most common symptom uh, that's shown here. Uh, and if you have participated in clinical trials before, you know that you're supposed to really record all adverse events that happen to patients over the course of the trial. And so, um, you know, we, we, we tend to see lots of AEs reported and not always clear that they're related to the intervention. Moving on to omalizumab. Um, omalizumab has two trials, the polyp one and the polyp two studies. Uh, and when um, you can see those here in green as compared with their relative placebos, which are shown in gray. Um, and this is the slide for the nasal polyp score change. So I think you can appreciate that patients who were on therapy um, had an improvement in their nasal polyp score. And you can see that it was at about between one and 1.25 improvement um, by week 24 as compared with the placebo who um, you know, didn't really change that much. Uh, the improvement in nasal congestion score in these trials is shown here. Um, you can see again that there's been an improvement in the nasal congestion score, uh, more so in the treatment group than in the patients who are on placebo. Again, uh, in the safety studies, uh, there's really no uh, safety signal that stands out with the ex exception of saying that the nasopharyngitis is also up there on the list of um, common um, adverse events as well as asthma exacerbation. Um, admittedly, patients who are on therapy seem to have fewer of these um, AEs than patients who are not on therapy. And then finally, the data for mepolizumab is shown here. It's shown a little bit differently than um, the data for the other two biologics. Um, so here you see on the left is the nasal polyp score and on the right is the visual analog nasal obstruction score. Um, and they show the, uh, in the red is the treatment group and in the gray is the placebo group. Um, and so on the left here, the nasal polyp score, you'll see um, they show how many people in each group seem to have worsening um, versus no change in their nasal polyp score versus improvement. Um, and as you look at and sort of digest this graphic, um, I think you'll see that there certainly seems to be a group uh, who received mepolizumab who had two, three, four point improvement in their disease. Um, so suggesting that there was a group that was quite responsive to this medication. Um, but 
um, you know, 30% had no change and 21% had worsening of their symptoms. On the right in the visual analog score for the nasal obstruction, um, again, you can see that there were certain patients who had a very significant improvement in their nasal obstruction score. Uh, I get supporting that there's a, a chunk of these patients who really respond to treatment. Um, the data were collected again for this trial um, to, re, uh, to assess the probability of need for surgery. Um, and over time, patients who were on treatment needed less surgery than patients who were on placebo. And then finally, again, the safety data, we can see the uh, most common adverse event is nasopharyngitis. And we're repeating this now so that hopefully it becomes very easy on our post-test. Okay, so how do we choose a biologic and what is shared decision-making? So this is the hard part and maybe what you came here for and maybe what will disappoint you. Uh, but we don't know how to pick the right drug for the right person yet. Um, if you treat other diseases that require biologic therapies, you might see that same concern for those other diseases. Um, I think in general, we, re we ex expect that there are going to be some patients who do very well on each of these available drugs and maybe the emerging drugs that come out. Um, but right now, we don't exactly know how to pick one over the other. And so that's where um, considering each medication and considering that the patient's um, preferences and comorbidities can be um, very helpful. So when you're considering a biologic, the first thing to do is to make sure the patient has disease that requires a biologic, um, that they have uncontrolled disease, they have severe disease, and their disease is polyposis um, because the non-polypoid sinusitis has not been studied with these biologics yet. Um, it's helpful to see if the patient has a comorbidity such as asthma uh, and whether that asthma is significantly severe or uncontrolled uh, because those comorbidities might drive you towards selecting a treatment that um, would be useful for both that comorbidity and the nasal polyposis. Most patients with nasal polyps are going to have high type 2 inflammation, but it can be helpful to look for evidence of that type 2 inflammation through things like blood eosinophil counts, IgE levels and allergy testing, or exhaled nitric oxide levels that can be elevated from the nose or from the lungs. Um, please um, inform yourself highly about these different um, therapeutic options because you'll really want to know a lot about these diseases so you can inform the patient about the, uh, about the biologics. Um, you want to be able to tell the patient about that treatment, about the side effects of that treatment, about um, the data that supports use of that therapy, um, and what the risks might be for that therapy. And that therapy could be a biologic or it could be one of the other treatments that we discussed. Um, it's really important to make sure our patients understand all of their options because you want them to be informed when they help you to make the decision about what's the right intervention for them next. Um, and then when we select the biologic, hopefully it's, it's coming as a result of the conversations we're having with our patients. For those individuals who do have comorbid asthma, it's helpful to see an asthma specialist um, or if you're an asthma specialist yourself, to select the, the intervention that might be most helpful for the asthma as well, particularly with the biologics. Um, so that way, maybe you get two birds with one stone. The Euphoria guidelines recommend that after you start the biologic, you plan to reassess the patient periodically to determine whether that intervention is working. Uh, and, and that's very reasonable. We don't wanna start medicines and, and keep people on things for a long time that aren't really providing them with any benefit. Um, so after six months of therapy, uh, and we sort of allow three to six months of therapy usually, because as you saw with the clinical trials data, it can take a while for people to reach their kind of maximum benefit. Um, we, we wanna see that they've actually improved substantially. Um, and the euphoria guidelines suggest um, documenting improvement in symptoms or symptom scoring. And so you might want to incorporate these into your practice if you haven't already. Um, you may want to document improvement in sense of smell, nasal congestion score, nasal polyp score, SNOT22, or the visual analog score. So if you have a what would be considered significant improvement in any of these scores, if the patient is happy with the progress, um, then you might just continue on that biologic and look to see if it's helping more and more over time. 
If the patient is not happy with the degree of improvement, you may consider a short course of systemic oral corticosteroids to, to help re reduce whatever acute inflammation is present. You may consider sending the patient to surgery while taking that biologic in hopes that the surgery will clean them out and prevent it from growing back, although that's not yet been shown um, through clinical trials or approved for FDA. The, if the patients are not getting better after six months, um, then consider changing to another biologic or consider surgery for the patient, and that's a good time to have another informed discussion. Once the patient's been on a therapy for 12 months, ideally you'd see significant improvement in all of these different um, um, domains of polyp scoring and congestion scoring and symptom scores. And ideally, you won't need surgery or systemic steroids to help treat the patient's symptoms. So if you are lucky enough to have selected the magic medicine for this patient, um, then right now we're recommending continuing that treatment for a while because um, as far as we know, when you stop the intervention, um, the, the inflammation and the disease may come back. If the patient has not met these criteria, Euphoria recommends considering another biologic or considering surgery. Um, I'm going to, to add to this to say that if patients have not met all of these criteria, but they're very happy with how they're doing, you may also allow them to continue on that drug for longer. Um, so here are some um, examples of what shared decision-making would look like um, for biologics or for other options. Um, so starting with somebody who is sort of new in their disease process and has used standard of care therapy of intranasal steroids and a saline irrigation and oral corticosteroids, um, you'll have the opportunity to talk to that patient about their the medical therapies that are available as well as the surgical therapies that are available. And the medical therapies can include the biologics, can include the fluticasone breath powered exhalation device. Um, and the surgical procedures can include endoscopic sinus surgery or other um, more temporary procedures. Once the surgical procedure has failed with or without the use of a corticosteroid stent, um, you can again talk to the patient about the biologic, considering a stent if they hadn't had one, um, or considering whether a repeat surgical procedure might be uh, beneficial for that patient. Um, if the patient's had a couple of surgeries uh, and, and they're really not doing well, um, I think that's a great time to start talking about a biologic um, or a, in addition to the additional surgical options that might be an op, uh, available for them. And then finally, um, if the patient has comorbid type 2 diseases, um, you know, the biologic might be a really good option. And so talking to the patient about that and, and surgery and, and making sure they're informed about both treatments. Uh, to be informed about all of these different options, and this is a summary slide that gives you some information that the patient might need to know to help you in that shared decision-making process. Uh, so we talked about this a little bit before, the intranasal corticosteroid sprays and rinses get steroids locally into the nasal cavity. Um, they are very simple to use. They can be available over the counter, um, are very inexpensive, uh, but if patients' polyps are really large, they might not be that useful. Um, and intranasal corticosteroids um, need to sort of be used with proper technique, otherwise can, can cause some irritation or bleeding. Um, the fluticasone with exhale delivery system um, is sprayed into the nose using that breath power device that I showed you earlier. It might get into the sinuses a little bit better, get deeper in into the cracks and crevices, maybe into the sinus cavities if they've already had surgery. Um, it requires some coordination and people who have really impaired lung function might have a little harder time doing it. Um, and it can be a little more expensive, and a lot of this depends on insurance plan coverage in your region. The, during surgery, the nasal polyps are removed by instruments inserted into the nostrils, and often and that surgery also includes debridement of the sinus cavities um, and opening of the ostea to um, many of the sinus cavities, if not all, to allow for improved corticosteroid delivery and deposition after surgery. Um, this is a kind of one and done thing for a lot of patients. There are complications. Many patients require that it's repeated. You should absolutely use intranasal steroids after surgery, as we discussed before, to try to prevent or slow the regrowth of polyps. Um, and there can be a significant cost due to the surgery, depending on your insurance plan.
the corticosteroid eluting stents um, slowly dissolve in that area over a few weeks. Um, this can be done in a doctor's office or at the time of surgery uh, and is, is kind of temporary um, and can be expensive, uh, but also might be a really good option for local therapy. And then finally, the biologics or injections that are given under the skin. It's important to recognize that um, depending on the drug that you pick, um, some of these are done only in the patient's home. Some of these can be administered in a doctor's office or in the patient's home. And so those might influence a little bit how you decide to treat your patient. Um, the biologics may also improve the diseases that are comorbid with the, with the nasal polyposis, including that asthma, atopic dermatitis, and others. Um, but the biologics also might be a long-term intervention to control the disease. Patients may still need other treatments, including intranasal corticosteroids. Um, and we acknowledge that the biologics are definitely expensive. Uh, and we hope for good insurance coverage and, and uh, a reduced out-of-pocket cost for our patients so they can afford these interventions um, if they're beneficial long-term. So we can conclude our case study, um, this Bob. <laughs> Uh, had uncontrolled and severe nasal polyps with asthma. Um, his asthma was not doing well. His nasal polyps weren't doing well. He had evidence of type 2 inflammation. Um, so we had some shared decision making with this patient, and we did discuss the endoscopic sinus surgery, but we also discussed the biologic therapies listed here in order of FDA approval. Um, and you can go through the, the different options with the patient. Um, surgery is something he may or may not be willing to undergo, depending on his um, you know, concerns about surgery and, and time missed from work in the recovery process. Um, dupilumab has a long track record, but it's dosed every two weeks, and so it requires sort of a frequent patient um, self-dosing at home. Melizumab is dosed every two to four weeks based on IgE and body weight and can be done in the office. Um, and has a long track record for other diseases like asthma. Mepolizumab has the shortest track record, but it's dosed every four weeks and it can be given at home or in the doctor's office. Um, so in summary, nasal polyps are highly prevalent and account for about 20% of all chronic rhinosinusitis. Common comorbidities of nasal polyps include asthma, allergies, and aspirin or NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease. Uh, nasal polyps usually uh, it has type two inflammation and the cytokines driving that inflammation and the downstream effects include IL-4, IL-5 and IL-13. Um, the medical management that's considered to be standard of care often has a short-term response but a high failure rate over time. And so we look to next level therapies for our patients. Functional endoscopic sinus surgery can be very successful for your patient, um, but it can be a temporary success because of the high rates of nasal polyp recurrence, particularly for individuals who have type 2 disease. Um, and we now have three biologics FDA approved for CRS with nasal polyps and others in the pipeline that allow us to use shared decision making to help select a treatment for our patient based on their preferences, based on their disease characteristics, based on their comorbidities, and also importantly, their insurance and their ability to pay. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, and we'll go ahead and look at that post-test and see whether it's a little bit easier to answer some of these questions, hopefully, uh, at the end of the presentation. So the primary cytokines involved in type 2 inflammation, the most common endotype in patients with CRS with nasal polyps, um, is it interfering gamma IL-12, TNF-alpha IL-6, IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5, or IL-17 and IL-2? And I'm seeing all the respondents selected IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5, and that's absolutely correct. So we can go to the next one. Which biologic showed improvement in nasal polyp score by at least two points in close to half the population at weeks 24 and 52? Um, at Benra, Dupilumab, Mepo, Omalizumab. And I see that the respondents thus far all selected Dupilumab, which is the correct answer for that as well which is the most commonly observed treatment emergent adverse event across the clinical trials of all biologics studied for CRS with nasal polyps. I can see that about um, half of the group is selecting injection site reactions and the other half nasopharyngitis. Um, nasopharyngitis was the most common, but injection site reactions are, you know, are still significant, particularly for people who are on therapy. Um, Mr. Brown, who has uh, polyps regrowing um, with type 2 inflammation, and what is euphoria recommending after um, 
inadequate response to sinus surgery. Um, uh, do we do medical management, biologic drugery, division surgery, EDS with fluticasone, or corticosteroid stent? Um, what we were looking for is biologic drug or revision surgery, so what everybody picked. And so this is a good opportunity to talk to the patient about the pros and cons of each of those uh, and help the patient to uh, make a decision about next steps. And then finally, Mr. Brown doesn't want to go through surgery again, so what does shared decision making mean? Um, and uh, are we you know, giving him advice? Are we telling him about guidelines? Are we giving him information about biologics? Are we giving him the pros and cons of everything? Looks like people are still voting. Um, I think at this point, the shared decision making means to give him all of his options, um, to tell him what his, um, you know, what the, what drugs are available for him, what biologics, nasals of drugs, um, what the surgeries might look like, um, and kind of discuss with him which might be the best for him based on the pros and cons and, and the availability of each of those interventions. All right, wonderful. Well, uh, great job. Thank you so much to everybody who participated in that post-test polling. Um, we'll now be able to spend a few minutes on uh, questions. If anybody has questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat. I don't see anything coming through, but we can give it a few more seconds. Okay, there's a question here. Um, isn't omalizumab supposed to be used for patients with very high IgE levels? Wouldn't that make it a suboptimal choice for a CRS with nasal polyp with type 2 inflammation? Thank you so much for the question. Um, we're learning a lot about omalizumab and the types of patients that it can help um, for different disease processes. Um, and it turns out that the dosing tables for omalizumab and the um, the patients that were included in the clinical trials for omalizumab um, started with IgE levels that were really on the lower side. Like usually the normal cutoff is around 100 based on your lab, uh, but omalizumab dosing starts at an, an IgE level of 30. Um, so you can give omalizumab and it can benefit patients who have lower IgEs as well if they have the right other phenotype. Um, and um, the, the level of IgE in the blood does not necessarily um, predict how likely that patient is to benefit from the omalizumab if the omalizumab is appropriately dosed. Um, so for nasal polyposis, if you have a lower IgE but the patient's getting the right dose, um, it could potentially still help that patient. Thank you very much for the question. We'll give it another few seconds to see if there are any other questions coming into the chat. And while I wait for other questions, I'm going to go ahead and show you this thank you slide. Uh, there are additional resources and information related to nasal polyps available at this website, integrityce.com. Um, and if you, um, on certain platforms, you're going to want to go to the claim your CME credit at the integrityce.com slash CRS with NP post eval 5, um, or you'll be redirected directly from this website. Thank you so much for, for coming this evening. I hope you um, enjoyed the information given to you today and we really 